All right, all right. Um, uh, welcome everyone to this podcast channel. Uh, to whosoever is listening to this podcast on either YouTube, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, or uh, Apple Podcasts, and this is my nineteenth podcast on this particular channel where I invite uh, young engineers who are working in the domain of machine learning, either uh, into research, into com- big companies, or either startups. And for this particular podcast, I have with us Dr. Bharat Ramsundar, who is um, who graduated from uh, Stanford University uh, with a PhD in computer science and also popularly known for his open source project, uh, deepchem.io, where he's leveraging deep learning techniques for drug discovery. And also he's working at a startup for decentralized data marketplace for AI applications. So um, welcome Bharat. It's it's really nice to have you for this particular podcast and uh, welcome to this uh, particular podcast. Yep, it's a pleasure to be on here. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. So um, to get off started um, uh, with this particular podcast, can you tell us a bit about your background? Like, um, how did you how did you end up with uh, starting the open source project DeepChem? And what was your background previous to uh, having the idea of DeepChem? And how like, and how is it using deep learning for drug discovery and or if other use cases that you already targeting? Mm-hmm. Uh, Yep, absolutely. So maybe as like just a quick summary there. Um, So the kind of uh, behind the DeepChem project, uh, I was doing my PhD at the time, uh, and I had gone to Google to do uh, research there. So I I was lucky enough to be selected as a Google research intern, uh, worked with some scientists there. Uh, We wrote like a nice paper that used kind of Google's in-house uh, deep learning system. This was uh, before TensorFlow, so it's called something called DistBelief uh, or Distributed Belief. Um, so we built a system and, you know, got some good results, but then, you know, the internship ended and I had to come back to school. And when I came back to school, the first thing I found was that I, I couldn't continue the research I'd started at Google because I couldn't reproduce it. So the original motivation was uh, let's simply try to reproduce the earlier paper, the work I'd done at Google. And uh, I had a theory that making it open source would enable the, uh, you know, more people to uh, try this out and would spur more ideas and innovation in the field. So uh, this was about 2015, I think. So used uh, Theano uh, and uh, uh, Keras as, as a wrapper and we built a first implementation that uh, reproduced these results and put it up on GitHub. And then from there, I think, uh, just kept iterating on the core uh, repository, had a number of contributors uh, who were interested and uh, got involved. And uh, the kind of community and package has grown from there. Um, I, I think now the biggest changes are that, you know, uh, originally there's this one model in DeepChem. Now there's something like probably 35 different machine learning models. It's uh, grown, I think, lots of things to do with, say, drug discovery, but also lots of general, you know, applications more broadly in chemistry, uh, increasingly in protein science, material engineering. Um, and I think where the community is trying to create like a, you know, powerful deep learning for science library. Um, like I, I know a bunch of folks are interested in material science where I, I'm only a beginner. So it, I, I really like the fact that it's become more community driven, more kind of uh, uh, hopefully useful for people's needs. So that, that's kind of just a quick summary of uh, of the project so far. Right, right. And so um, you did mention that most of the application, like the application aspect of this particular project is much more oriented towards the people who might have an expertise in chemistry because it's it involves drug discovery and definitely medical professionals. But um, you being a computer science student, what was your application, like what was your motivation of using or leveraging deep learning techniques into this particular, like what what really stood out uh, as a student that, uh, that um, had a spark in you that said, hey, deep learning is a very potential thing that we can use for drug discovery and why not mm-hmm. rely on the traditional expertise from medical professionals? I think that's a great question. Um, so I think a couple answers. I think the first was, I think, around 2014 or thereabouts. Uh, I believe Merck sponsored a Kaggle contest uh, for in deep learning and drug discovery. Um, so I didn't participate in the contest, but I and watch the results from afar. And I think uh, George Tall, who was one of, I think, Jeff Hinton's students, uh, won this contest by making a model that was kind of uh, considerably more predictive than the next best contestant. 
Um, so I think that spurred my interest. Uh, I was also lucky enough to work in a research group that uh, you know, allowed me to explore these questions. So my background as an in undergraduate was in pure mathematics. Uh, but when I came to Stanford, I, I was also lucky enough to get supported by the Hertz Fellowship. Um, so the Hertz Fellowship encourages uh, kind of its recipients to uh, you know, think scientifically outside the box. So I decided to join a lab that focused more on studying proteins and uh, you know, chemistry and things like that. Um, and I was still trying to figure out what I do in the lab, but I think when I kind of saw this uh, Kaggle contest, I became interested in kind of trying to extend and build upon these results. Uh, and luckily I was in an environment where, you know, uh, the other folks there had the expertise in the parts of drug discovery and chemistry that I, I as a more kind of a computer science mathematics student, uh, didn't have at the time. Uh, so th I, I think that's probably a quick summary of how I got interested um, and uh, started in the field. Right. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because um, I normally, I normally, uh, uh, is I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in this particular domain because I started off my PhD very recently and that was one of my uh, major goal that I, I might have a very surface level knowledge of deep learning, machine learning, and I'm really motivated to apply it for uh, medical applications. My my focus is mostly on brain imaging. So I always, um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to look and maybe probe uh, people who, who who can explain uh, what was the what was the inception or what was the inception point for people to consider deep learning to be used in medical uh, applications. And right now, when I talk to a lot of medical professionals who are relatively new, they they just know the uh, surface level aspect of deep learning, but they are really 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 uh, uh, ambitious about using deep learning. So I, I always try to. Um, find like why why are medical professionals really looking forward for deep learning but yeah that's that's uh that's a really interesting perspective that you shared um but also a question like this might come as a, as a very naive question from me is um why did you choose your deep Chem project to be an open source and why not uh, be something of a proprietary thing that you can maybe later on use to build a product out of it, or maybe a startup, mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'm, I, I might like, I'm, I'm not sure if open source projects are related to startups or not, but you, you could have always uh, built something mm -hmm. highly secretive or uh, closed environment-based product. Why did you choose um, DeepCam project as an open source? You know, it's a great question. Um, so I think that, you know, at the time, like uh, when I was at Google, one of the big questions that was circling there was that, you know, what would the successor to disbelief be? Um, and uh, the you know eventual you know project that came out, of course, was TensorFlow. But the big change was disbelief was a closed source project, while TensorFlow was an open source project. Um, and internally, there is a um, very I think influential essay written by Jeff Dean, uh, who argued that you know with MapReduce previously, Google had an open source a project. So what happened was that Hadoop came in and became the standard. Um, so I, I haven't read this essay. I think it was internal to Google in several years. So I'm going from memory. But I recall the argument was something like, you know, Google missed an opportunity to really have an impact by not open sourcing MapReduce because now, you know, at, at the time, you know, people come in knowing Hadoop rather than MapReduce and you have to teach them MapReduce when you know, MapReduce was the original. Um, so I think that spurred Google to uh, release uh, TensorFlow open source. And uh, for me, I think I, I, at, at the time I read this essay and I think it really kind of spurred uh, a change in my thinking as well, that the act of releasing something to open source could be more meaningful than uh, making something that's closed source and proprietary. Uh, so I, I, I think I probably credit that essay uh, for spurring my interest in uh, doing this in an open source fashion rather than a closed source fashion. And, and do you see any immediate benefits out of it, like like not compared to maybe like um, we already know MapReduce and all those things are highly popular. And not to mention even Yopra, even DeepChem is uh, highly popular because I talked to a lot of people and I al already heard uh, the name quite a few times. But um, on the top, like, would you say any benefits that have already you like you have already been seeing being it an open source? Or are there any cons that you might have seen uh, making mm -hmm. something open source? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the pros are that you just get to meet a lot more people. Um, uh, so I think, uh, you know, like I, uh, 
one of the big advantages I think of been working open source is you just get to meet contributors and people from all over the world who are interested. Um, so for DeepChem, I think we have you know people from like you know multiple countries in Europe, uh, India, Asia, Japan, China, um, like Africa. There's just you know a broad range of like different contributors who get involved. Then you get to I think make friends that you wouldn't otherwise. Which is, I think, um, it, it sounds like, you know, corny and uh, like a kindergartner tale, but I think it's true. Like, I think you get to make connections that you wouldn't otherwise that can enrich kind of your work um, and your life. Um, I think that, you know, in many ways, like building a closed source thing can be lonely. Um, if you have like a large base of customers, then it's, it's not so bad. You get feedback, you know, you make an app, you put it out there, you get that feedback iteration. Uh, but if you're building scientific software, I think one of the challenges is that scientific software is already a very niche domain. Um, there's only so many people who, you know, would be potential customers. So there's excellent scientific software packages out there, you know, things like MATLAB, but lots of, you know, uh, ANSYS. Uh, there's definitely these very established, you know, vendors who do amazing scientific work. So I'm not at, at all trying to diss like they're you know, very hard uh, work. But I think the advantage of open source is that it lets you kind of broaden the tent. Like you can, um, so with DeepChem, we try to, we have a very broad number of uh, tutorials, something like 25 different tutorials that explain the foundations of machine learning. Uh, we've had people who use these tutorials and you know, uh, oftentimes they do have other scientific background, but by the end of working through this, they become experts in machine learning themselves. Um, so I think it's very powerful to be able to kind of grow your, the set of people you can work with because you don't have to come in with the deep understanding of the tool and be willing to pay large amounts of money up front. Rather, you can try it out for free. And if you want to keep using it, well, great, it's still free. Um, so I think that's a powerful advantage that you can reach more people and potentially uh, a greater audience. I think there's powerful benefits to, benefits to closed source software though. Like I think one of the weaknesses of deep chem is that it's so broad. Like um, if you have 35 different models that do many different things, an upgrade, like uh, for example, like one of the most painful things in machine learning is upgrading. Uh, so when we upgraded from Theano to you know, TensorFlow 1, then TensorFlow 2 now, uh, now we added PyTorch support. Each of these upgrades has just been a tremendous undertaking. Um, you spend a lot of time thinking about these details. So I think the maintenance burden of open source shouldn't be underestimated. I think it's a lot harder than like a, um, you know, former mentor at Google, he said, you know, you interns get to come in and work on the flashy things while, you know, the Griswold engineers work on, you know, maintenance and uh, serialization formats. And I didn't understand this, uh, but I think I'm beginning to feel a bit of that pain. Um, so that's the hard part that open source takes a lot of time and effort to maintain. It's not so easy as just putting a script out there. The more people use it, the more bugs you have, the more you have to think about testing, solidity, infrastructure. Um, you also rely on community goodwill. Like uh, uh, for several years, Travis CI has provided say, an excellent service, uh, you know, allowing you know, open source projects to run their testing infrastructure for free. Uh, but you know, recently, you know, Travis is a business, they had to stop offering the service. I'm very grateful to them for their years of free support, but now we have to figure out how to migrate to kind of the next thing. So you live a lot on kind of donations, like donated time, donated resources. Um, the logistical aspects of, you know, maintaining open source project can be uh, formidable. Um, there's also not, you know, well-scoped grants for this yet. There's a couple, like the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation has been starting to support scientific machine learning projects for uh, no, scientific software projects. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, money, resources. It, it's a lot like, you know, any other institution. Like you have to spend a lot of time thinking about like all the non shiny parts behind uh, the scenes to make it all work. So that's, uh, that I'd say is the hard part. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, the general takeaway from that is like, if you have a uh, if you have an open source project, it opens up yourself to much more opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. And it 
could be something of a, a difficult thing to manage and keep on uh, tackling those challenges. But um, before I move on to the next question, because one thing that you mentioned, and I, 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 this wasn't on the list, but I want to ask this question. It might be one of the most cliched questions of, that you might get from students is uh, you being on both of the sides of the extreme of like academia and plus now on the um, industry. Do you see a value of uh, consider, like making the trade-off between PyTorch and TensorFlow? Because uh, even though like nothing compared to you, I also face challenges uh, like when I try to switch from one, one platform to other. And most of the people say that if you know your basics, it should be easy to switch, but that easy is uh, very broadly defined. So in your ex aspect, um, what I have read and what I've seen is a lot of industry adapt to TensorFlow much faster, but PyTorch is much more flexible. But if you were a student and if you wanted to pick one framework right now from scratch, you are a newbie, what would you, what would you suggest? I know this is a very opinionated question, but uh, how would you go on choosing your framework? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think if you're a student, I'd actually su suggest neither. I'd suggest using Jax. So I think <laughs> Jax... Uh, it's the next, uh, I think uh, Google realized that, you know, TensorFlow 3 would not be a possibility. It's just too hard. Uh, so Jax is, I think, they're, you know, an attempt from Google uh, engineers to like build foundations from the ground up. Um, so I, I, I like kind of like the fact that, you know, Jax attempts to be kind of like even less heavyweight. Um, and, you know, I think if you can't use Jax, I'd probably recommend PyTorch. Um, I use TensorFlow personally for most things just because I know it well. So I think like there is a bit of lock-in that sometimes you just want to get something done and you just kind of go with the tool, you know. Um, but I, I'd recommend, um, I think it doesn't matter too, too much. Like I, I think that if you learn the principles well, um, like you can switch in a way, it's a bit like a programming language. Like if you're an excellent C++ engineer, you probably can switch to Java if you need to uh, or vice versa. It, it will take some doing. I think that it's not entirely straightforward, but it's very doable. I think for like, um, I, I'd say more fundamentally even, I'd say like best not to worry about it. Like I, I know some excellent research that's still being done on like TensorFlow release one from like a long time ago. And they just, and the researchers have been ever upgraded, but they keep getting good results. So maybe just pick the best tool for your problem where the best might be, um, you know, what you know, what you find comfortable. Um, like, it, it's, it's gonna, it's, it, this will sound a bit like an industry saying, but, you know, focus on the downstream deliverable rather than the tool uh, when making these choices. Yeah. So that would be my two cents. Yeah, yeah, that's that that makes more sense. Like it's it, it's better to know your framework very completely rather than making the switches just because something might appeal to you better or on certain aspects. So yeah, definitely. But um, I'll I'll come to the this particular topic of startups once more uh, towards the end of this podcast. But I, I wanted to probe you on one of the um maybe the most open questions is um what are the what are the what is the actual motivation of using machine learning in medical applications like what what is the end goal that medical professionals or anyone on the other side of computer science might have like what do they really look forward because uh and uh you, you might have a better uh broader aspect to this the, this thing is because I, I recently started working on some of the brain imaging projects from NSF and uh, it still remains a lot of ambiguous, like they, they are trying to use deep learning techniques for uh, maybe like the only technical term that they say is uh, under, like discovering biomarkers, but how exactly do they want deep learning or machine learning to be used in these techniques? So what is the, like, to, to make it much more general, what is the, like, what are we trying to achieve by leveraging machine learning on medical applications? I think that's an excellent question. Um, it's, I think that there is a very real case that the effect of machine learning so far in this entire field has been limited. Um, oftentimes the first solutions that come to market are more cost cutting rather than like anything else. Um, so one argument you could say is that maybe this doesn't add too much actual value to patients. Um, 
like that that said i think that you know anytime you bring a new way of doing something to the table you open up the ability to answer some questions that you couldn't do before um so i think for me i think the um kind of the initial goal of getting involved with this drug discovery research was to be able to design medicine that you couldn't design today. Um, I, I think as you go further into the field, you find that that's a very, very high bar. Like human chemists are very good at their job. Uh, the hard part I think is often in the biology and not the chemistry. As in, you know, why, what causes this disease? It's not, I think that is probably the most important question. Like for lots of diseases, we don't really have a very clear answer to that. So that is, is I think the hardest question rather than the, uh, like most of what machine learning does is that I have this protein and now I have an engineering challenge of trying to find a molecule that has desired properties. And machine learning is beginning to let people do this more cheaply. Um, so I think the hope is that eventually you can improve these techniques to the point where you can solve kind of the deeper questions, you know, make advances on the basic scientific understanding. Um, I, I'd say that that in a few places, there are glimmers of this, but I would say it's far from being achieved. So I think the eventual goal is to, you know, enable foundational breakthroughs in the science, um, you know, of, you know, what causes the disease? How do you cure it? Um, that by making tools that, you know, enable us to think differently and answer new questions, um, but if you look at, say, the history of like drug discoveries, so for like um, gene sequencing, when it first came out, like it was billed as a revolutionary technique that would change the way medicine was discovered. And I think slowly it has, like you see increasingly, you know, uh, large numbers of projects using, you know, uh, sequencing in their pipelines. But even now I'd say it's that there's only one or two new medicine that you could argue really has come about because of sequencing and not otherwise. So even for a technology as foundational as sequencing, it has taken decades and has had so far still limited effect. I think with AI, you will find probably a similar effect where really it will take a long time for these techniques to be like practically useful. Um, and in the meanwhile, I think they are neat, but they haven't really made a foundational advance. So a, a little bit of a non hypey answer there, which is that uh, there are a few questions that can answer better, but this might take a long time before it really leads to a foundational scientific breakthrough, like curing a disease that you couldn't cure before. All right. So, yeah. Uh, hooking up to that particular few words that you said over there, like, would you say that, I mean, first of all, one thing is uh, definitely clearly visible is uh, machine learning is uh, highly effective, like, uh, uh, using NLP techniques, you can actually sort through records and clinical records and find some few interesting things. But that is much more of automating something what human labor might have done and minimizing human error. But that is what uh, statistical definitions of using machine learning uh, advantages might entail. But would you say, like you use words like deeper questions and foundations, so would you say deep learning or in general, any domain of machine learning has the capacity of uh, providing insights that wasn't possible using traditional medical knowledge or, or for drug discovery, chemistry based um, science? Would you say deep learning has that amount of potential where medical professionals would be shocked that, hey, we did not see this because... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly quickly give a pointer that I was I, I was recently attending this conference from Microsoft where the, uh, there's this uh, principal scientist called Rich Caruana and he he uses this ex, uh, example of uh, interpretability where he he said back in 1995 he used neural networks to find the correlations between I guess um, pneumonia and asthma and deep learning provided some insights which were not clearly making any sense but only after medical professionals sat down and they used all the knowledge that they had based on disease orders, it made sense. And that was maybe like, that stood out to me uh, back, like maybe a year back uh, to analyze that, hey, deep learning can actually find these things, just not in the way we humans understand, but medical professionals do. So in your brief experience of um, working on this project, uh, interacting with people and your experience so far, do you see deep learning 
really uh, at least touching the domain of foundations and innovations in these fields or is it just merely is it just going to be still an automating tool just better than humans maybe that's a very good question i i think that primarily it has been a tool for automation um but i i think that you're beginning to see kind of a deeper scientific understanding emerge um i i i think it's very fuzzy like the emergence of kind of scientific understanding um it's it's very dependent on you know it, it, the language that the uh uh, kind of scientist speaks versus the language that the machine learning person speaks. So I think that, yes, I, I think that deep learning or machine learning will lead to foundational scientific advances, um, but I think it'll be sort of hidden in that, uh, for example, like I bet like there's a lot of people working now on like deep learning for um, improved signal processing for scientific instruments. So you know, in a lot of new scientific instruments, you're beginning to have things like deep learning systems underneath the hood that, you know, enable, you know, the uh, mass spec machine or the sequencing machine to be more, um, more effective in the kind of medical domain you mentioned, probably like, you know, radiology machines will have increasing amounts of like, uh, you know, scanners will have increasing amounts of deep learning. So I think it'll become a foundational tool that powers a lot of like new scientific techniques. So in a way you could argue that that process has already started and that is already leading to scientific advances. Um, when you come to a question of the like a foundational shift in science, that's, that's hard because it's a change in how people see the world. Um, I, I think that there is a potential for AI techniques to really lead to foundational shifts in scientific understanding. Um, but I, I would claim that this has not been anywhere near achieved yet, that there has not been that type of uh, shift. So I, I think the potential is there, but as of now, it has not been achieved. Right, right, yeah, that makes sense. And this brings me to the next question, which is highly, highly related to um, that particular topic we're talking about is, how much do you do you, would you say medical professionals trust using deep learning? Like, do they rely on it or do they use it as a, uh, something like a tool for trying out like, okay, if deep learning does something, that's great, a bonus to my research. But uh, do they highly value deep learning insights right now? And a follow-up question to that particular topic, if you can answer is, achieving interpretability because I'm, I'm, I'm sure you might have heard this terms of explainability and interpretability around. So how much would you say people who are working in drug discovery or maybe uh, on certain aspects of medical application trust these things? And um, is, there a, is there a dire need for uh, achieving interpretability in the industry? How would you, how would you have any comments on that? So I think, you know, to clarify, I, I do know a little bit, I know less about kind of the medical side of things than more the drug discovery side. So I can't speak too much for how doctors think about things, but I, I will say, you know, from my experience with scientists, uh, like biologists and chemists, like, I, I think that, I, I think that understanding and acceptance of these tools has been slow and will continue to be slow. And I think it's often for good reason in that if you're a biologist or a chemist, or I imagine a doctor, and you care really about a downstream, you know, uh, thing like, you know, uh, your understanding of this protein or say like the actual benefit for a patient, uh, it's, it's just another tool kind of in your hand. Um, and until that tool has proven itself invaluable, it doesn't mean that much to you. So I would say for most downstream scientists, it's not that I think that they have strong feelings for about it, against it uh, in most people. It's just that until it really makes a difference for questions that they care about, uh, they will by necessity not be terribly interested because they have hard jobs and lots of other pressing uh, concerns. So I think if for people working on AI or machine learning, the challenge is to you know, make the case that this is a 
something that can make your life much easier. Um, so like almost thinking about it as like, you know, if, you know, to use a market analogy, like they're, they're kind of the customer, so to speak. And if you're kind of, you know, quote unquote, selling the new technology, you have to make a case for why they should care um, because they're busy people. Um, so for now, I think that that really hasn't been uh, entirely made. I think there's a lot of hype, a lot of promise, but uh, the, the the case is still being made. And I, I think that, um, you know, we're, were I a patient, I would much rather have an experienced doctor treat me than a newfangled deep learning system. And I imagine that's true for many of us, uh, maybe especially for those of us who know how these systems work. Um, to answer your second question about interpretability, I think it is a very important topic. I know there's been a lot of effort put into improving the interpretability of these systems. I, I think it's a, it's a bit of a fuzzy topic. There's I, I think interpretability really rests a bit in the eye of the beholder. Like, what do you find interpretable? Um, so I, I personally have not worked too much on interpretability. It's a question that, while interesting to me, is not as compelling as, say, basically that you know downstream proof of usefulness. Like, if you can make something useful, then you can usually come back afterwards and figure out why. Uh, and what I will say, the counterexample to that, though, is I think there's some really important work being done on the theory of machine learning that tries to explain, you know, how do these things work? Um, and I think it's an extremely challenging field, um, and progress has been slow. Uh, but that, I think, like, my hope is eventually you can have better understanding for how these systems actually work or don't work that guides uh, pra practical understanding of, like, what's happening behind uh, the black box. Um, so I, I'm interested in kind of seeing, you know, the interpretability research progress, but I, I, I think maybe to use this customer analogy again, like I see myself as say the customer of that, as in, I love to try these things. Um, and I'm hoping to find something that helps me understand better what I'm doing in practice. Right, right. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you summarized it really well, because, uh, like you said, it's either on the <laughs> two extremes of this particular, um, uh, uh, line that once uh, once it could be the case that deep learning is highly useless, it's not providing any insights to the um, medical professional and hence um, he or she might just discard it. And on the other, like it just jumps uh, throughout a black box uh, transition that says that, hey, it did something. It's really useful now. It caught my attention. But I guess the third question that it arises is to question that. Why did it do that? And um, I guess that's what my understanding of interpretability would be like, because you might have to question that you provided me some great insights, but I want to know why, like, just give me a understanding. So I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a loop, like you, you, you made the jump. I mean, I, I already see a lot of applications who have made that jump, at least for long-term illnesses. Like I'm, I'm working with uh, long-term illnesses, like uh, uh, migraines and uh, Alzheimer's, like a lot of questions, they, medical professionals still don't have an answer to understand but all they have a very high interest is if you tell me the person would have this particular illness in the next 10 years I can just save him or her but only once it is detected we have just nothing to be done so I guess yeah I I, I do think interpretability is something um, yeah it, it's it's still unanswered a, a lot of a lot of research is being done but um yeah, uh, I, I think it could be a bottleneck maybe somewhere along the line in not just medical domain, but in general, wherever deep learning is really applied. But yeah, uh, your, your perspective was something really nice. Yeah, only if it's like people should be focusing much more on the usefulness of deep, deep learning rather than just focusing on uh, achieving interpretability. That makes sense. And um and would you say, would you say, like, in your opinion, would you have any uh, overestimated uh, understandings of machine learning or any underestimated uh, applications of machine learning? Because uh, at least if, like we can choose a common space over here as medical applications. Would you say some things, some, some applications are highly underrated or something are highly overrated? Uh, that is something highly 
impossible like you said um, right now there are no real discoveries on a foundation level using deep learning but some people might have a very high expectation but there has to be a line drawn right like deep learning cannot be a magic wand that can just surpass all the medical knowledge that has been integrated by people so what do you say in your opinion have you come across or maybe uh, you you think that it is a highly overestimation from uh machine learning or highly underestimation like you you think it has a great potential but just not utilized enough i think um i think in medical applications more broadly i or you know drug discovery uh i think that there's still i think there's a lot of hype around it but i think there's a lot of quiet skepticism that uh there's a lot of flash but i think a lot of you know practitioners like the biologists or chemists or i imagine the doctors are very skeptical because they haven't seen it provide day-to-day value for them um and i think until that practical day-to-day value is convincingly demonstrated um the impact will continue to be uh limited so i think that I think that it's uh what's underestimated I think is the difficulty of using these techniques in practice that uh what I mean is that um you know often times I think it's very like the architectures matter the new algorithms matter but it's really you know understanding the downstream application and like what makes a difference there that can be very very hard to build an understanding of. So in in the medical space for example, I I am long term very optimistic about both on the drug discovery side and maybe uh on the um a kind of a medical application side that there will be kind of foundational advances that result from these techniques. But I am short term pessimistic that the things the tools we've invented so far are sufficient for really answering these questions and i think a big part of this is really like education and shifts in understanding where you it, kind of the tools seem to improve i think that more outreach has to be done to the people on the other side so they understand what the tool does or does not do um and i think that needs to you need to kind of work all work together to make something that really delivers a you know meaningful downstream effect um so i think you know there's kind of these gartner hype cycles i feel you're familiar with them where yep so yeah. you know for anyone who hasn't heard about it there's like you know a period of hype at the beginning for new technology or idea and then you know then after a while it starts to head downhill people start to get a little bit disillusioned by it then over time it kind of resettles itself out i I think that deep learning has had several years of hype and maybe now I anticipate not too much disillusionment because I think the techniques actually quite work quite well with a number of things but say a little bit of disillusionment that there's no magic here but instead um years of effort will be needed to transition these into like practical tools um so maybe that's the shift I I can see happening I, i don't know if that quite answers the question though yeah it in fact does i mean yeah uh, you rightly said because a lot of people uh, it's it's definitely something uh, that sounds fictional but yes a lot of people have predicted that this could, this could lead to a winter of deep learning that would say uh, deep learning won't be as much as popular and outspoken right now as it has been in the past few years but yes um this again this this would be a, coming from a person who is highly inexperienced like me over here in this domain is uh, i guess uh, i i don't know it's just like you sh- said but uh, i w- i would add something to that is um, it's not just only the uh, effort that we need to do is to understanding and making these applications work better on the other side but i guess um at the whole coming back to the same point is explainability of these models are really making a dire need to be addressed because uh, again, again uh, i have been just working since the past, since past few months but it really becomes a tedious task to 
make people understand who just don't know what, what uh, let's say, con- convolutions mean. It's it's really hard for medical professionals to understand what exactly, what does it really take when we say there are billion parameters that need to be trained and what does, what does it really make sense? So I think, yeah, yeah, I, I do understand. And uh, these applications need to be much more um, highly usable on the customer side too. But yeah, and um, coming like deviating a little bit out of machine learning is I want to know what are some of the lesser known pros and cons of working at big companies versus uh, small companies or in, in case, uh, in your case, a startup, like you, you are pretty much uh, the sole author of a lot of things that you have started. So, uh, I mean, we all know the popularly known, like, of course, big companies will pay you well, your financial security is much more concerned versus it's a l- much more scrutinized or messed up when you are developing your own project. But would you have any, some great insights that you would say, are any like lesser known facts about working at big companies versus um, pursuing your own startup? I, I think it's a really good question. And I, I think the first um, answer to this always depends on, you know, what's your, you know, family and personal situation like? Like if you have a family that depends on you, that would struggle without your income, then I think a big company can be an excellent place. Like if, you know, uh, you have parents or like siblings or, you know, wife or kids, and they need you to like be in or, or, you know, husband or kids, uh, either way, like, um, I, I think the big company just might make a lot more sense. If you have visa issues, uh, like, uh, you know, it's pretty for folks from India or elsewhere, like it's uh, been very bad in the last few years, but hopefully a bit better, you know, knock on wood after January. Um, it's, uh, it, I think that these are things I think a startup is bad at. Like, I, I think a startup, um, and oh, uh, just to quickly mention, so I, I co-founded a startup after my PhD and I stepped back from it uh, actually uh, earlier this year, about January or thereabouts. So I'm working on a couple of new projects that are more in stealth right now. But I, I think that, you know, speaking from my experience so far, like a, a startup can be very, very, um, it's like riding a roller coaster. Like there's a lot of like uh, tumult uh, involved. Uh, this can be professional tumult. It can be kind of financial. It can be kind of like emotional. Um, I, I'd say when doing a startup, I think that the key thing I'd say is like first kind of make sure that financially you're in a secure place. Like um, there are you know, founders who are very, you know, upright and who will actually like share openly their finances. There are others who will maybe not say, uh, people will sometimes hire you when they don't have that much in the bank. So, you know, if you're joining a startup, kind of do your own research and uh, see how open the company will be with you. If you're founding a startup, I think that there's a whole other set of considerations. I'd say talk to a lot of people and do a lot of your own research to gain your own understanding. Um, I I think, again, it all comes back to finances. Um, There are greater and greater levels of risk when you're founding something new. And the question is that, are you personally, you know, in a situation where you can handle that level of uncertainty? And I I think that the thing I'd emphasize there is just because that right now that might not be the right solution does not mean 20 years from now it couldn't be. Uh, if you say earn a good nest egg and you, you've seen, you know, there's some inefficiency and you know that you could do a better job than, you know, the big company you've worked at for a long time and you're, I don't know, in your forties at that point, well established. Great. Actually, I think a lot of like the most successful like companies are founded by people later in their careers. Like uh, one example I like to use is like, I think like uh, uh, Dr. Morris Cheng, like who founded a, a, a company that isn't too well known in the US. It's called uh, TSMC. Um, so the thing is, TSMC is now the world's biggest semiconductor company based in Taiwan, Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing, bigger than Intel and NVIDIA. And he founded it when he was 55 or something. I think he like went back home to Taiwan after a long career at Intel, or I, I might be mixing up a bit the facts. And, but he had that know-how, that expertise and just like, so I, I think same with kind of uh, uh, Mark Benioff and uh, Salesforce. So I'd say if you want to do a new company, you don't necessarily have to do it as a student. Um, yeah, I think the other thing I'd say is like, 
be very, very careful if you want to do a new company. Like, assume that you don't know much at all. And uh, just talk to a lot of people, do your own research, and be very cautious of the risk you're taking on. And think about the professional and personal repercussions if it fails. Because one of the things that won't be said is that failure is much, much, much more common than you think it is. And you can tell yourself your idea is good, but that's different from the idea actually being good. And then it's very easy to fool yourself. So sorry, that, I, that maybe that was a little uh, kind of bit uh, bleak there, but I, I think it can be very worthwhile. Like, but I think again, make sure you're in a place where you will not be professionally or personally caught in a bad situation if it all fails. Um, and assume that there's a 90% chance of failure, no matter how good your idea is and act that way. And if you are very careful about managing your risk and still can do it, you could have a very successful outcome. So I, I kind of started from the big company question and went all the way down to startup. So hopefully that wasn't too far off course. No, that, that was actually a really great advice because it's really it's really easy for anyone uh, who is uh, genuinely interested in uh, developing an idea is uh, when we look at a lot of uh, internet blog posts about why Combinator or maybe if it's uh, Forbes 30 and the 30, it's really highly motivating to consider that, hey, why not start early? But it's also like the advice that you said is definitely really useful because it's like like you said, it's it's not at all necessary that you need to start early. It's, it's like having a strong foot on the ground is really much more uh, useful uh, to secure. Like it's, it's, it's the common phrase that says like plan your plan B first and then work on your plan A. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really great advice, but, but actually I, I want to tie that question of your, uh, that answer of yours into a next question is how would you say, because uh, one, one of the uh, nice things that I found about your profile is you, you really, you really used your PhD at Stanford into developing a lot of your own projects. And I believe like, like you said, you, you recently started working on something really nice and new uh, this year. So how, how would you say, like, how did your PhD uh, played out along developing your ideas? Was it something that complemented the process of developing your deep cam project or um, your computable uh, uh, startup? Or was it something you were really ambitious about to pursue and you made in like the, you put in the extra efforts uh, each day to develop something that was inhumane? So how would you how would you say like um, what's something a PhD something of a compliment uh, to your work or how did it play out? So I think um, basically I think deep chem was the core of my PhD. Um, in fact, I think I have a deep chem in the title of my thesis. Um, so I was lucky enough to again have a supportive advisor like uh, uh, Dr. Rijay Ponde. I was supportive to have like I, I was lucky to have supportive kind of uh, colleagues and mentors who let me kind of explore the direction I wanted. So while I was doing my PhD, I kind of focused on doing good research. Um, and I wasn't thinking too more, far about longer term, like what I want to do with this or not. Um, I think it is very hard to do something. I, I, again, I'm just speaking personally, like to do something on off hours. I know a few friends who've achieved this where they work at one company and then nights, uh, weekends, they work very hard at something else to build out a base. Um, and it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of willpower to do that. I personally find it challenging. Like I think that for me, um, it, if I'm, it's hard to maintain two very separate streams. If I'm like working on something, usually I put a lot of myself in and I have energy left over, but it's for hobbies or like, you know, I like cooking things or, you know, try a new recipe, et cetera. Um, so I think it just depends on your personal, like if you're in a stuck in a position where you don't like what you're working on day to day and you have the ability to, I'd recommend try to find a new place that lets you enjoy what you're working on. Um, it's, I think, a few people do have that, you know, tremendous willpower to like build something on the nights and evenings. I personally have not ever been able to do that, but I do know a few who have. If you are, uh, if you're blessed with that stamina and that willpower, more power to you. That can be like an amazing way to like 
have a, a firm foundation while kind of laying the groundwork for the next thing. If that is hard for you, then maybe think about how can you learn more in your current job? Um, so for me during the PhD, it was a long process of learning more about biology and chemistry. Like, I think that was the hardest part for me. Like the, I think um, chemistry is very hard and I think biology is a mystery is maybe the way I'd say it. Like there are kind of uh, depths to those fields that are very hard to like, and I'd say even now I would only count myself like an office. So, but I think I was lucky enough to be able to like choose a job where I was able to like pick up enough of these skills that enabled me to answer other questions that I was interested in. So if you can find a way to turn your current, you know, job, whatever it is into your advantage, that can open up new doors. Or you can work very, very hard uh, late at night and then uh, on the weekends, if you have that willpower. And if you do, my hat off to you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is uh, this is highly interesting because I threw out a lot of last question that I just asked. It, it really relates me very well. And I, I don't know if that something that came out of me based on my own questions, because yes, um, uh, I, I totally second that uh, thing that you said, um, a lot of your efforts went on into understanding biology and chemistry. And that's what my few months in the past have been like, it's easy to work with uh, highly curated data sets that is that are available on Kaggle websites and all those places where uh, we use computer vision techniques to work on images. But once you try to deal with a very novel problem where uh, your team is highly inexperienced in deep learning, but highly experienced on the other side of uh, application of deep learning. So it, it, it's really hard to make sense of the medical data and apply deep learning. So the fusion of these two techniques is really interesting, but also a lot of challenging and a lot of homework needs to be done before just transitioning from one thing to other. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That's really nice to learn from you. And um, going in a very um, uh, bottom to top fashion is uh, I wanted to learn how did you build your expertise? Because um, I mean, uh, I see I see on your profile, you come from a mathematics and electronics background uh, in your bachelor's from Berkeley. And then you later on transitioned uh, to a PhD in computer science. And you end up working like it's a quite of a breadth of uh, sciences that you have covered, like mathematics, electrical, computer science, uh, biology, chemistry, and maybe right now you're working on a lot of um, sales and marketing things too. I, I don't know if that would be true or not. But how, did, like talking about this particular podcast, uh, how did you build your expertise about machine learning? How did you go on and like... <sighs> I mean, we did talk about like, how did you develop and how did you see the potential of deep learning? But how did you go on from learning these things to implementation? Because it, it takes a long time for people to actually just do that thing, like learn things and implement it very successfully. So throughout your process, what was some of the things that worked out for you? And what would be your do's and don'ts for that particular thing? It's, it's a great question. And I think and the first thing I'll preface this with is it's a very personal process. Like you have to understand how your brain works. Um, like some people I know the way they learn is they read, they just read and they think really hard about it. They read carefully and slowly, and then they come out the other way, having understood it. I, I lack that ability. I will read something and it'll, you know, if it's a story, I might retain more of it, but it'll like go in one year and go out the other year. So for me, I learned by doing. So if I, for machine learning, I took a class or two, but I felt I didn't really understand anything. Uh, this is, um, I, th I think I took uh, Andrew Ng's like intro to machine learning course, which is uh, still on Coursera. Uh, provided a good foundation, but I came away from that course not understanding how I could, why I should care. Um, like I, I could see there were lots of cool things that were covered, um, you know, no, uh, no disrespect to Andrew or his course, of course, it's a great introduction, um, but I just was struggling to understand why or how I could use it. So I think that for me, like identifying a project where I, there is something I wanted to achieve and using machine learning to do that, I think really solidified the understanding for me. So I think my recommendation would be that find something that you want to do and then try to use machine learning to do it and use it in practice. I think that will solidify 
like I, I think again it all comes down to need like if there is a need to do it i think you will likely figure out um how to make use of it um like you mentioned for example with say the doctors you're working with right like i think right now you face an interpretability challenge if i'm projecting you need to you figure out how to explain and i suspect that at the end of this you'll be very good at uh, explaining to doctors how how these technologies work um i i think maybe another thing on that vein is like i think teaching others like if you've learned a bit like helping other people and like explaining it to them can solidify your own understanding um so like i i was lucky enough to ta for some of like uh the computer vision courses and uh, natural language processing courses at stanford worked with uh uh, Andre Karpathy and uh, Richard Socher as a uh, TA for their courses. And I think picking up how people who just knew more than I did, like thought about it really helps. So that can be another way, like if you can find an opportunity to work with someone who you respect and learn a bit about how they think about a problem, that I think can be very effective. Um, I think there's a trade-off in that. I think when you do things for yourself, you often discover new ways that maybe someone uh, even other people in the field don't quite know, but it can be very slow. Whereas if you work with someone who's an expert, you can learn really quickly. So be that a PhD, be that a job with kind of a mentor or colleagues you respect. Um, I, I, I would also say the other thing is like to be patient. Like I think that depending on your background, depending on your know-how, it can take a long time to learn skills. And I think long can be like from months to years or even decades, depending on the challenge. Um, so I think that if you are persistent and you keep looking for opportunities, I think eventually you'll figure it out. But I think if you kind of give up halfway, that won't happen either. But I think uh, keeping on trying maybe is like the final bit there. Right. Yeah, definitely. That's that's really interesting. Like I guess my quick takeaway from that would be patience would be a real key if you want to develop something really novel and learn something really interesting and yeah that's a that's a really nice thing I guess that that part comes from a lot of your experience of doing your PhD I guess like is one of the key things that people learn from PhD is patience and um, uh, struggle so <laughs> I'll, I'll take that takeaway quickly from that but um, and just one last question is um I know we we touched this topic very briefly, but again, if 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 a person is really new um, to the dom like to the understanding of what really takes to build a startup, how would you say, or at least would you, uh, if you were to list at least five or six things that really takes on that one should at least master if they are thinking of building a startup uh, in the future or like in the very far future, what would you say a CS student should know things about? Because um, we had mostly the audience that we are uh, talking to over here is mostly CS people. Uh, how would you say, what are the key things apart from the technical knowledge that really needs to be learned and how, how, how have like, how has been your insight so far on that particular aspect? So that's an excellent question. Um, I would say that a lot of the learning I've had to do has been uh, the school of hard knocks, so to speak, where I mess something up and I'm, you know, pay the price for the consequence, but learn not to do it the next time. So I, I think that there are smarter ways of doing it than my way. Um, <laughs> I suggest that maybe seek out opportunities where you can learn these skills. Um, and again, I think the best way to learn anything like this is like, you know, find someone you respect and find a way to work with them as they do it. Um, it's, I think a lot of these like skills, like reading books is useful. Like if you want to read like, in business books, like uh, there's a number of like standard ones out there uh, about startups. Um, like I would also recommend reading widely. Like I think like there's a very, you know, fascinating range of books out there about different businesses. Like, um, you know, I think it's things like Bad Blood, you know, talking about, you know, Theranos about failures, but also I think successes. So I think like um, there's like excellent histories of Google or Facebook or Uber or other companies out there. 
So maybe read widely, think about what made this work or not work. Um, talk to a lot of people. I think that typically conversation, especially off the record, is the best way to get an accurate understanding. Um, I think also try to be very humble going in that I think business is an art and I, I think I'm a novice at it, so I will not claim any special expertise there. Um, and just kind of, I, I will also say like, it talk to lawyers. Like I think lawyers often see a lot of like the backside, like what is a business deal actually? Like it's often a contract when it comes down to it. And you know, this is gonna be a terribly nerdy uh, thing, but it's almost like a programming language. There's a structure to it. And if you understand the structure that gives you an in insight into the process. Um, but yeah, nothing exotic here. Like read, talk to lots of people, find opportunities to work with people you respect. Try it out for yourself. But again, I think the key thing is like be aware of risk as in the actions you take might have unforeseen consequences that come back to bite you. And if you talk to mentors or other people you respect, sometimes you can avoid these consequences, but sometimes you can't, it's, uh, uh, it has to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting, like if I were to uh, quickly say what you, uh, what you uh, quickly summarize, what you said is like, have, like exploring would be the key thing if you want to build or at least move towards a startup, because I guess if you are looking for jobs or maybe a, just a very academic research and as a PhD, it would be much more narrowed down into partic on a particular skill or maybe particular research topic. But if we are looking at startups or maybe building a product, it needs a lot of a lot of like you said like uh, brute force like one I, I guess uh, I, I wouldn't uh, discard that fact like I mean it, it takes a lot of failures or maybe at least uh, stumbling onto a few things that didn't work in order to find what would really work so yeah that would be a really nice um, advice yeah definitely and I'll also stick like, um, it, it would be great if you could stay after this call. Uh, like you said, most of the interesting things happen off the record. So I'll, I'll take a few minutes after this call the recording ends uh, and maybe just get some few insights. But it was really, really nice talking to you because um, I guess uh, you, this particular podcast was really meaningful to me because I have just found like few people who work on the intersections of computer science plus uh, uh, like deep, deep learning or machine learning plus medical aspects. So it was really nice knowing you. And also you have the aspect that I'm personally interested in is like a startup or maybe a young open source project based uh, tint to your profile. So I'm, I'm, I would be really following you. Um, I, I follow you on Twitter. That's uh, that's more than enough, I guess, for me to remain updated to a few of your musings. So yeah, I'll, I'll also lay, leave, leave a link to your Twitter and your books that you have published out there on Aurelie. It's really nice to for people to read and at least get in touch with you if they have any specific doubts. But um, it was really nice having you. Thanks a lot for um, have, having uh, have, like being on this podcast on a Sunday. That's that's really quite uh, too much to ask anyone. But yeah, thanks thanks a lot. Would you have any last words to uh, share? Or you know, um, thank you for inviting me. I think it's always a pleasure to kind of chat with folks who are uh, interested. Um, and I think that. Uh, I, I think the only thing I'll say there is like, if you were someone who's interested in kind of, you know, building something of your own, I think persistence and like not rushing into it, I think can really, really make a difference. So like do your homework. I, I fail to do this at times and it's bit me. So the more homework you do, I think the better and the more likely you will be to actually succeed. And if something looks too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, <laughs> But yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It, I'll just stop the recording. It would be great if you just stayed for a few minutes. Let me just.